good afternoon. Sorry we're a little delayed. Um, just a few things at the top and then I am um, happy to take your questions. Yesterday, Secretary Austin and his counterparts from the UK and Australia concluded the third AUKUS Defense Ministerial meeting in London. In a series of meetings, the leaders reviewed progress made under the Enhanced Security Agreement over the last year and reaffirmed their commitment to the AUKUS partnership for decades to come. Together, the leaders reasserted that AUKUS offers a unique generational opportunity for our three nations to enhance our military capability, deepen our interoperability, and strengthen deterrence toward a shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. The AUKUS Defense Minister's meeting communique outlining the partnership's historic progress is available on defense.gov. Uh, switching gears, the department continues to monitor Tropical Storm Helene, which made landfall in the Big Bend area of Florida overnight as a Category 4 storm before weakening to a tropical storm. To support response efforts, Secretary Austin approved separate requests from the Florida and Georgia National Guards for a dual status commander in each state. A dual status commander is a National Guard, regular Army, or regular Air Force officer who is jointly managed by the commander of U.S. NORTHCOM and the chief of the National Guard Bureau and is allowed by law to serve in federal and state statuses simultaneously. Florida has nearly 3,900 guardsmen, 450 tactical vehicles, 13 rotary wing assets, and six boats conducting emergency response missions in 21 counties around the state. North Carolina has 358 guardsmen activated, Georgia has more than 300 guardsmen on orders, and Alabama has 43 guardsmen on orders and standing by. And on the active duty side, NORTHCOM has deployed a small team to Florida to be prepared to respond quickly to FEMA requests for assistance. As you know, this is a rapidly evolving situation. The department remains prepared to support response efforts as necessary. And for, for, and for further questions about National Guard missions, I would direct you to contact the specific states in question. For active duty support efforts to FEMA, please contact U.S. Northern Command. And for service-specific evacuation efforts, it's best to contact the services directly. And last, I know you're seeing reports circulate about a strike in Lebanon. Secretary Austin spoke by phone earlier today to his Israeli counterpart, Minister Gallant. The United States was not involved in this operation, and we had no advanced warning. Minister Gallant spoke with Secretary Austin as the operation was already underway. This operation happened, happened within the last few hours. We are still assessing the event and don't have any additional information or any further specifics to provide at this time. But with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. I don't see AP in the room. I'm going to go to the phone and then happy to come back. Uh, Lita Baldor, AP. Hi, thanks, Sabrina. Um, a couple of questions um, on Iraq. Will all of the troops that are currently um, at Baghdad and Assad be transferred to Erbil or will some come home initially? And if so, can you give a rough estimate of the number that will actually depart the country? And then secondly, in as this evolves and the U.S. pulls troops out of those areas, do you expect there will still be 2,500 troops in Iraq at the end of this? Or what is the Pentagon's rough estimate right now as to the number that will remain in the country? Uh, thanks, Lita, for the question. So um, in terms of uh, an announcement, I think we'll have more to share later today. Um, as you know, the global coalition under um, Combined Joint Fa Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve, that mission is changing from the global coalition to a bilateral security partnership with uh, the Iraqi government. Um, I don't have, you know, numbers to read out and locations to share with you, um, but I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, our, our footprint is going to be changing uh, within the country. but. Um, for more specifics, you know, I'm just not going to be able to go into those details at this time. Um, I think we will have more to share later today, but um, from here, I just I don't have any more specifics to add. Uh, I'll come in the room. Phil. Um, thanks. I know you don't have a lot of information about these strikes, but it's mm -hmm. a, quite an event. And uh, can you give us any sense, first of all, whether you know if Hezbollah, Hezbollah leader Nasrallah is alive? I don't have any information on the strike itself. We're still gathering information as this just happened a few hours ago. So I can't, I, I would refer you, you know, to others to speak to this operation. I, I just don't have any more. 
Okay. And, and, and you know, since the United States is pursuing ceasefire, uh, a ceasefire, yeah. you know, what was uh, Secretary Austin's reaction to, to this uh, uh, news as he learned of it? And, and what was the discussion like with his, his Israeli counterpart as it was going on? Well, I think, you know, as I mentioned in the top, the secretary was, well, first, I would say that we were not given an advanced warning of this operation. Um, you know, the secretary spoke with Minister Gallant when the operation was already underway, um, having no involvement, having no knowledge that the strike was actually going to occur. Um, we're still pulling for more details and trying to understand um, the operation itself. Um, in terms of their conversation, I think you've heard me say it, you know, these are pretty direct conversations that he has with Minister Gallant. Um, he has them frequently, you know, sometimes multiple calls during the day, um, sometimes almost every day. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into further details of the call, but I can tell you that, you know, other than having no knowledge or no involvement of this strike, um, the United States, you saw announcements from the president um, and, and other world leaders. We're going to continue to urge for a diplomatic solution. Um, we want to see, um, you know, tensions quell in the region. And so we're going to continue to push on that front. Did, did, uh, did his Israeli counterpart confirm that, that Nasrallah was the target of the strike? I'm not going to go into more details other than what I read out at the top of the, at that, the top of my remarks. Natasha. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, how concerned is the secretary that this latest strike on Beirut, which appeared to target Nasrallah, is going to precipitate Iran's involvement now in a broader war? And also, has any um, have any plans for a non-combatant evacuation operation now been sped up in light of these events? So I think that remains to be seen. Um, we're still gathering information. As you know, it just happened a few hours ago. So. Um, you know, we're still assessing and, you know, when we have more details to share, if we if we can, we, we will. Um, in terms of, you know, any type of evacuation, um, I, and I know you've heard me say it here before, but, you know, we plan for all types of contingencies. Um, we are a planning organization. Um, we have assets in the region to support, you know, any type of event. Um, should we need to? At this time, I'm just, I don't have any more details to provide. Well, um, so the, the Houthis claim today that uh, they carry out an attack with about two dozen uh, ballistic missiles and drones targeting three destroyers and that they hit them. Um, do you have any information about that, especially whether any ships, U.S. ships were damaged in that, uh, in that incident? I can confirm that no U.S. ships were damaged or hit. Um, there was no injuries um, to U.S. personnel. Um, we did see a complex uh, attack launched from the Houthis that ranged from, um, you know, cruise missiles and UAVs, um, my understanding is that those were either engaged and shot down or, or failed. Um, but n at no time did, you know, any hit a U.S. ship. Is it the U.S. assessment that, that these the U.S. warships were the target of that attack or, or were they other vessels that were potentially the target? Sometimes it's hard to tell um, whether being, they're being shot in the vicinity of a U.S. ship or targeting another vessel. Um, we always take measures for our self-defense, so I can't really uh, tell you the intended target other than to say that, you know, I'd refer you to the, <laughs> refer you to the Houthis. But, um, you know, we did what we had to do to, to protect our forces. And at the end of the day, no ship was hit, no damage, um, and no injuries to our personnel. Body. So you clearly said that you were not given any um, prior um, notification about this, however, um, the phone call took place while this operation was underway. So during that phone call, did Mr. Gallant inform uh, Secretary Austin about the operation? Yeah, so I'm just not going to get into more details of the call. Fadi, what I can tell you is exactly what I, I said at the beginning, which you can, you know, take inferences from that. But Mr. Gallant spoke with Secretary Austin as this operation was already underway. Um, again, it happened within the last few hours, so we're trying to get more details. And um, I, I believe on, on Wednesday you said you haven't seen any indication that there's any imminent uh, Israeli incursion into mm -hmm. Lebanon. However, today the Israelis announced the IDF that they're mobilizing two of their brigades in the north. Mm -hmm. um, does this um, recent um, activity change your assessment of the situation on the northern border of Israel and whether they're um, preparing for an invasion? 
Somewhat to Natasha's uh, question, um, we're still assessing, and that remains to be seen. Um, we certainly don't think uh, a, gr a ground incursion is um, you know, the right path forward. Um, that's something that, you know, the secretary has been pretty clear about in, in his calls. Um, and, you know, what we don't want to see is is a wider regional conflict. And so that's why you've seen, you know, from the president's level to the secretary, um, the continuing um, engagement for diplomacy. And we believe diplomacy is the best path. And forward. finally, if I might, sure. um, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, you guys were following uh, Mr. Netanyahu's speech from the UN. Um, during the ANGA. Was that a speech that um, gave you uh, hope that uh, the diplomatic solution uh, can succeed and the Israelis are open uh, to a diplomatic solution? I think every time that we engage the Israelis, you know, we um, have a, a good and direct conversation with them. I think diplomacy is not off the table. I think everyone wants to see um, this resolved. And the way it is going to get resolved is through diplomatic channels. So we're going to continue to push for that. I'm going to go to the phones and then I'll come back in the room. I saw you, uh, Charlie. Uh, Carla Babb, VOA. Hey, Sabrina, thanks for doing this. Um, just to follow up with what you told Lita on Iraq, you said the footprint was changing. Is the U.S. withdrawing from Iraq? If your answer is that the U.S. is not withdrawing from Iraq, can you at least tell us how the footprint is changing, whether it's increasing or decreasing troop numbers? And then finally, just how important is the Iraqi partnership with U.S. military right now? Thanks, Carla. Um, so, nope, the U.S. is not withdrawing from Iraq. Nope, I cannot get into more details on what that front footprint is going to look like. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, when Lita asked her question as well, I think we'll have more details to share later today, but I'm just not going to get into uh, details from the podium right now. Um, in terms of our relationship with uh, the Iraqi security forces and the Iraqi government, um, it's a crucial one, and it's one that we certainly value. We are in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government. Um, and our partnership has led to the success of diminishing ISIS from what it was 10 years ago to where it is today. Um, the the strongholds that they had in Iraq, they don't have those anymore or not what they used to. Um, so we certainly value the partnership that we had and continue to have with the Iraqi government. Um, and. This is a step in, in our relationship and a progress towards a bilateral um, security agreement. And, um, you know, we'll have more details to share when we're ready. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. Whether or not uh, Hassan Nasrallah is alive or dead, the situation in the Middle East has escalated. Is the Defense Department sending any more troops, aircraft, uh, other assets to the region. And uh, before you had announced that a small number, excuse me, the Pentagon announced a small number of troops had uh, deployed to the region. Is there any information about how many, what units and what type? For example, are these air defense batteries or are these uh, troops preparing for a possible NEO of Lebanon? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for the question. So no force posture changes to announce at this time. Um, in terms of that small uh contingency that we've you know sent forward um, I just don't have more details to provide at this time um, again we are a planning organization we plan for a, a, a wide range of different events that could occur uh, but I just don't have uh, I'm just not going to be able to get into more specifics from here Charlie ah Sabrina thank you <clears throat> I just want to drill down on the timing of the uh, Austin Gallant phone call you said a couple of times already while the operation was underway. Mm -hmm. This wasn't done before the operation had begun. So as it was underway is when they spoke. That's correct. But they didn't discuss that that, that in itself doesn't suggest advance warning. So as it was happening, he may have informed. I believe I said we did not receive any advance warning. So that is correct. We did not receive any advance warning. But it stands to reason if they're in the middle of a phone conversation, they might say it's this is happening now. That, that may not be in advance, but it is underway. Yeah, I, as you can appreciate, I'm just not going to get into further details of the call. What I can tell you is the operation that you are seeing, you know, being reported uh, was underway when uh, the secretary and minister Gallant spoke. We were not involved in this operation. And again, we had no advance warning of the operation. Gallant called Austin. 
they, I mean, the calls were connected. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the details on on how we connect those calls, Charlie. But yes, they they ag- had agreed to speak, and the, those calls were connected. And as you know, the secretary is traveling back from London right now, so he took that call and wrote. But Sabrina, mm-hmm. forgive me. It seems like we're splitting hairs here. But if he's if 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 one person initiated the call and said this is underway, that that in itself is inherently an advance warning, even if it's already happening. It's not a two minute warning. But it's a 10 second warning. I think we are splitting hairs because I would not consider that an advance warning when something is already underway. Um, I'll go back to the phone and then happy to come back in the room. Uh, Chris Gordon, Air and Space. Uh, Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, The U.S. announced this week uh, that the U.S. will help train uh, 18 uh, Ukrainian F-16 pilots next year. Um, Can you provide a little more fidelity on that announcement? Will these 18 pilots all be trained in Arizona and relatedly, uh, the DOD previously said it planned to train uh, 12 Ukrainian F-16 pilots in fiscal 2024. Uh, we're now just a couple of days out from the end of that. So has the U.S. met that previously announced goal of training uh, 12 F-16 pilots in the U.S. this fiscal year? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for the question. Um, in terms of the announcement um, and where they'll be trained, uh, you know, I just don't have that uh, for you right now. Um we continue to train Ukrainian pilots um, that either come to the United States or through the Air Mobility Coalition uh, with our partners in different parts of the world. Um, as you know, these pilots have to meet certain metrics, which include um, you know, being proficient in English language. So uh, we're continuing to work with the Ukrainians. Um, this is something that we know is a priority for them. It's a priority for us. Um, and we're continuing to work with them to make sure that their pilots get the training that they need so that when they return to Ukraine, they can be as effective as needed on the battlefield. Um, I'll take uh, two more from the phone and then happy to come into the room. Uh, Jared Zuba, I'll monitor. Hi, Sabrina. I think uh, I think Charlie might have asked this, but just to be clear, um, do you know who initiated the call? Was it uh, pre-scheduled? Was it uh, the secretary reaching out to uh, Defense Minister Gallant? How did that work? Uh, yeah, so Jared and Charlie, as as I as much as I appreciate the questions, um, the secretary and Minister Gallant speak pretty regularly. Uh, it's initiated on both sides to have these types of conversations. I'm just not going to go into like who initiated what when. Um, I can tell you from what I already said uh, previously, which I know um, you know led to the bit of splitting of hairs here. But again. When the secretary spoke with Minister Gallant, this operation was already underway. Um, we had a, had no advance warning of this. And of course, we were not involved in this operation. Um, all right. Taking one more from the phone and then happy to come back in the room. Uh, Mike Glenn, Washington Times. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks a lot. Uh, I agree with you that the, that a phone call at the time should not be considered an advance warning. It goes in on my question. If the fact that the Pentagon once again had no advance warning of this Israeli strike and only learned about it, you know, at the time. Does that indicate that it, the Israeli government simply doesn't trust this administration and thinks it'll try would have tried to uh, to interfere with their operation? Yeah, Mike, I I would push back on that. I I don't think that is the case. I think that's an unfair characterization. Um, you know, trust is certainly built, but. Uh, look at just the engagements that the secretary and Minister Gallant have had um, over the last two weeks, um, speaking regularly. I think if uh, there was any type of, um, you know, fracture in trust, uh, you wouldn't see those type of levels of calls and engagements occurring frequently, and not just at the secretary's level, but you're, you know, there's other components across the administration regularly engaging with their Israeli counterparts. So I'd, I'd push back on that characterization. Um, and, you know, I think you can expect the secretary to continue to engage Minister Gallant um, in the future. All right, coming back in the room. I'm going to go over here and then. Yes. The secretary just called on both sides to not escalate the situation. Is this an escalation? Yeah, again, we that remains to be seen. We're still assessing. Six apartment buildings in the southern uh, the suburbs of Beirut have been leveled. That's not, you, you have to assess whether that's an escalation. You're telling me that. I do not know that to be true. So again, we are still assessing the situation. Uh, we are going to continue to have our calls with our, you know, the Israelis to get more details. I appreciate the question. I hope you would also appreciate that this just happened a few hours ago. So yes, we are still doing an assessment. Rio. Thank you. 
Um, Japan's ruling party LDP selected a former defense minister Ishiba as the next prime mm -hmm. minister. So first, what would be the DOD's reactions to the election? And secondly, Ishiba has proposed ideas such as reviewing the U.S.-Japan agreement on the status of forces. So what would be the U.S. reactions to such proposal? Look, we have a great relationship with Japan. Um, the secretary was you know, just recently there over the summer. Uh, we look forward to working with the new government um, to further deepening our cooperation and building upon some of the deliverables that, in fact, you were on that trip, so you know very well um, some of the things that were announced um, that the secretary announced in Tokyo. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly welcome this new administration, looking forward to working with uh, the new Japanese government. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Andrew. Two questions, please. One, as far as after two plus two in New Delhi and now at uh, the leadership, with the leadership of President Biden at in Delaware Quad, uh, mm -hmm. U.S., India, Japan, and Australia, they met there. So as far as U.S.-India relations are concerned, military, military relations, where do we go from here now? And also at the same time, uh, if the escalation, the uh, threat, from China or others have gone down or what is the future there, those nations who were a little bit threatened by the, uh, China, including Taiwan and all that. So um, the Quad uh, is a group of like-minded nations coming together um, because they believe in a free and open Indo-Pacific. That is the whole, you know, that is one of the many purposes of the Quad. Um, so in terms of uh, you know, where does the relationship go from here? I mean, look at the extensive amount of details that, you know, the president um, and the White House announced just last weekend from those high level meetings that happened in Wilmington. Um, I, you know, I'm just not going to go through the litany of, of every deliverable that was announced, but I think the partnership between India and, and the United States is certainly strong. Um, the engagement that you saw from the president with um, Prime Minister Modi and others within the Quad uh, builds upon the foundation and principles that the Quad was founded on, which is, you know, one of them being to ensure the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, but I direct you to the White House for, you know, for more details of the Quad meetings. And um, yeah, I'm just not going to go through that from here. Second, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as uh, uh, peace is going on around the globe or not, Two wars are going on, one in, of course in the Middle East and second in Russia and Ukraine and everybody is trying to bring peace in those between those nations and, and those regions including the Prime Minister India tried and now uh, President Yulansky met uh, was in the White House yesterday and today he's meeting with President or former President Trump in New York. At his, so uh, where do we stand? Uh, who are behind these uh, uh, nations that wars are still going on, Let, let's say in the Middle East, uh, who's behind, uh, uh, is it Iran or, uh, I mean, of course, uh, Hamas and uh, Abdullah, but uh, Iran or uh, any other nations they are involved. Uh, and as far as US, I mean, Russia and Ukraine is concerned, who's behind those wars there? Um. What an interesting question. Um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, when the war in Ukraine started, it was, uh, you know, directed by Russia's head of state. And we know Vladimir Putin certainly has his agenda set on Ukraine. Um, you know, I don't have to go into detail the work that this administration has done to ensure Ukraine gets what it needs uh, in order to continue to fight every single day to take back its sovereign territory. And, you know, I'm not going to... Uh, <laughs> go through, uh, you know, a historical look back over the last two and a half years or, you know, the last year. But, you know, on October 7th, a terrorist organization brutally attacked uh, Israel. Um, and I think you know what happened and unfolded since then. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, and I have two uh, questions. First one, there are some reports claiming that the U.S. Uh, cut off intelligence sharing with the Israeli regarding to the current operation in Lebanon. Do you confirm that or are you still sharing the intelligence with them? We still regularly coordinate with the Israeli government and share intelligence. Um, I, I, I can't, I I'm, I'm, haven't seen this specific report, but when it came to, if you're talking about this operation, um, 
again, the United States was not involved in any way um, and we had no advance warning. I'm just not going to get into more details on our intelligence sharing other than that we, you know, we do share intel and, and you know, generally speaking, um, you know, Israel faces threats from, from all sides. And so, of course, we share, um, you know, information on, around that. And my second question, um, regarding uh, Secretary Austin said uh, today that uh, he hope, uh, hopes that uh, don't see a ground uh, incursion in Lebanon. Yeah. And if that's happened, it's going to be a chance to the conflict could be a regional conflict. So um, did you uh, give this message directly to the Israelis and what they uh, what they respond about what uh, your concerns about any ground operation in Lebanon? Look, we don't want to see a wider regional war. We've been very clear about that from the beginning. Um, the secretary continues, and I think this administration broadly, continues to urge for diplomacy. We know that is the best path best path forward. Um, and, you know, diplomacy cannot succeed amid, you know, uh, continued tit for tats back and forth. So um, that's what the secretary's conversations are like with Mr. Gallant. That's what he continues to urge for. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. No. Yeah. What is, uh, has any change, uh, has, the, has, the United, has the department been asked to prepare for an evacuation of Americans from Lebanon? And, and secondly, uh, after the call, putting aside of, you mm -hmm. know, what was said on the call, after the call between uh, the secretary and, and Gallant, um, was there, did the secretary do anything? Did he, did he, did he make any calls? Did he brief the president? Did he, um, you know, change alert, ask for a briefing with the, with the, with, with General Carrilla at CENTCOM? Well, what did the secretary do after, after this call? Um, thanks, Phil, for the question. So I'm just, I'm just not going to get into his schedule and exactly what he did, but I think uh, it's fair to say that, you know, you should reach out to the White House. And, um, you know, I, I know that the, the president has been briefed on, on um, the, the events that have unfolded, but I'm just not going to speak for more actions on, you know, that the secretary um, took. Other than that, you know, we're continuing to monitor what's happening in the region, and that's exactly what he's doing. And he's, you know, back in route from his uh, uh, trip and, um, you know, can do that from the plane and will continue to do so throughout the weekend. Um, in terms of uh, evacuation planning, I think that was your, was that your second question? Um, again, we plan for all types of contingencies, all types of events anywhere in the world. Um, should we need to, you know, perform any type of evacuation, uh, we are postured to do so. We have assets in the region, um, but that's, we're not. Um, and we certainly plan for a wide range of contingencies at all time. Again, as you've you know, no, we've sent a, a small number of additional forces into the region. Um, we continue to be a planning organization. And from the very beginning, you know, from October 8th on, we moved assets to the region should we need to plan for any type of event, whether it be an evacuation or something else. Um, so far, that hasn't happened. You're not there yet. We're not there yet. Right. Yes. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. Um, a Chinese think tank published a report today about the South China Sea uh, saying there's more than 10 uh, air, time, air and uh, maritime encounters uh, every day between the U.S. and China. Um, and it says the majority of these encounters are safe and professional. I'm wondering whether you agree with that assessment. And it also alleges that uh, a phone officer from the U.S. Uh, poses the threat to maritime uh, freedom in the South China Sea. And do you have any, any comment on that? I haven't seen the report, so I candidly can't comment on that. Uh, I can tell you um, with, com with, with uh, strong confidence that we um, stand for the freedom of navigation um, and we will continue to sail, fly, and operate anywhere um, in the world in international waters. I'll leave it at that. And I wanted, I had a follow-up about the AUKUS defense ministerial meetings sure. from yesterday. The secretary mentioned in his remarks that the AUKUS innovation leads are developing a robust uh, two-year agenda mm -hmm. to work with industry. What would the secretary be looking for from that agenda and any advice that he would have for industry that want to um, participate in pillar two activities? Thanks. I would refer you to the joint communicate, the communique that's online. I think that has more details that would probably address some of your questions. Well. 
Um, you earlier, you said that um, they secured 8.7 billion in new aid from the United States military aid, um, including for their current operations in Lebanon. Can you confirm that and provide any details on that, if so? Yeah, I think there's a bit of um, confusion here, Will, so um, I'm actually glad you asked that. Uh, so the assistance referenced, um, what you were just referencing, is from the supplemental appropriation for emergency assistance to Israel that Congress passed and that the president signed into law earlier this year. Um, a significant portion of that aid will go to strengthen Israel's air defenses as Israel continues to face attacks um, and threats from Iran and its proxies. So again, this is previously announced assistance. And for more, I direct you to the State Department. Not specifically linked to Lebanon, which is what they had said it was. Right. This was previously announced when the supplemental passed, which was back in April, I think. Yeah. Friday? Yeah. Yes. And then I'll so, go to and so in more. addition to the uh, support uh, Air defenses in Israel, this package includes, according to the Israeli uh, section, that has to do with supporting the what they call war effort. Um, can you explain to me the uh, logic of this administration trying to understand here? On the one hand, you want diplomacy to succeed. You don't think escalation is the solution. Netanyahu from the UN, Onga, says clearly he's going to continue the war. At the same time, you provide him with the weapons to continue the war. Can you explain that to me, please? Fadi, as you know, Israel faces threats from Iran and its proxy groups and was brutally attacked on October 7th. So this administration has been clear that in the face of those attacks and consistent threats, you know, almost every single day. And again, October 7th, I direct you to the fact that an Iran-backed group brutally attacked Israel that day. Um, this administration, this president has been committed to providing Israel the support for its self-defense. Um, this FMS supplemental package, as you know, these are, you know, sales and assistance that can take a very, very long time. So I just I just want to be clear that, yes, we are still providing um, Israel assistance that it needs in its self-defense. But some of what, you know, Congress appropriated out in the supplemental is going to take some time, just like. For Ukraine, the supplemental that was allocated for Ukraine, some of that is PDA coming directly off our shelves. Some of that is USAI that can take a year, two years longer to reach the the front lines. Does that make? Does that help? I mean, uh, I understand you keep referring to October seventh. Um, what about October eighth? What about October 9th? What about forty one thousand Palestinian dead later? What about what's happening in in Lebanon? Is this still within Israel's right to defend itself? I think we've been pretty clear, Fadi, and and we've had you know conversations about this. Uh, we don't support um, you know innocent civilian dies. We believe that you know the the casualty count is too high, um, and you've seen the secretary emphasize that in his calls, um, you know, from very early on. Um, that's why we continue to urge for diplomatic means to resolve um, what's happening in the Middle East, and and you know I have to direct you back to the point that. Um, it wasn't just the, pr it's not just the United States pushing for this. There are a Arab nations pushing for this. There are European countries pushing for the need for a diplomatic resolve. And so, um, you know, we're going to keep trying. We're going to keep working hard every single day to make sure that happens. Um, and we're going to keep having frank and honest conversations with our Israeli counterparts. Louis, did you have a yeah. Notifications, please. Um, when you've been saying we were not informed with regards to this operation, are you saying we the Pentagon or we the United States? We the United States. I mean, I'm. let me clarify. I speak on behalf of the Department of Defense. So I will say that on behalf of the Department of Defense, we were not notified about this operation. Is it possible that other parts of the United States government may have been informed, uh, and not specifically the leadership in this building, but maybe somewhere else? Again, not not going to speak. You know, I'm I'm not at the the another podium here, but I I think that's highly unlikely. And then the other clarification: um, you were asked earlier whether you were seeing signs of any imminent ground incursion, which you know you spoke to last week. Um, can you say that whether you're now seeing signs of an imminent ground incursion because your answer last time uh, earlier today was we don't think a ground incursion is the right path forward is are you saying are you inferring that there will be something happening in short order or uh, again I mean can you just clarify what you're I'm not inferring anything I'm, I'm saying that we do not believe a ground incursion is the right path forward um, we are continuing to engage our you know 
I mean, the Secretary engaged Minister Gallant today. Uh, we certainly want to see a path towards diplomacy. And just just to clarify, because I, I don't want to split hairs here. And I, you know, while I'm not speaking at, um, you know, the White House podium, I think I just want to be very clear that when I, I think definitively when I say we, I think I can broadly say the United States was not and had no knowledge of this operation and was not giving advance warning. Um, you know, again, <laughs> The call happened as it was underway. So I think it, I just want to be super clear that, you know, words are not parsed, that there's any indication that another, you know, building or, you know, agency had a heads up. I think we are all on the same sheet here that uh, the United States had no knowledge of this. Okay. And again, on this imminent, because sure. you've just given the same answer, <laughs> but, you know, we don't think the ground incursion is the mm -hmm. right path. Yeah. Since you've previously said we do not see any sign of an imminent ground incursion? Are you still not seeing any imminent sign of a ground incursion? As of right now, I mean, one, I don't want to speak for the Israelis. I, as of today, you know, we're not seeing that. Um, but I would refer you to them to, to speak to their own operations. Charlie, did you have one more and then we yeah. can wrap up? One more question. Um, you have repeatedly said that the U.S. military has the capacity for a mass evacuation if necessary. You have the capability. Mm -hmm. As of a few hours ago, the specter of that mass evacuation might have edged closer. If you're talking about the, you know, the USS Wasp and the Marines on board, the, all practiced and ready to do that, you may be talking as many as 80,000 Americans who are in Lebanon. The U.S. military has the capacity to mass evacuate tens of thousands of Americans, uh, Americans as they did in 2006. The United States military has incredible capabilities, and we are an incredible force. And because of that, I'm just not going to go into speculating on a scenario that hasn't happened. What I can tell you is we plan for a wide range of different contingencies. And that's what makes us so great at what we are able to do is because we have plans on the shelves that we can easily dust off. Uh, we practice, we do exercises, uh, we do drills constantly that make us ready and prepared should we need to be called up for whether it be any type of event we would be ready for. Um, again, I'm just not gonna go down the path of, of speculating. Um, I can tell you that we are going to do everything that we can, of course, to uh, defend our forces in the region, to protect US citizens. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're just, just not gonna go down a hypothetical path right now. Okay, all right, thanks everyone.